Which side are you on? If you had lived in the 1860s, would you be for or against Canadian Confederation? Welcome to Confederation.com, and today we're counting down our top 10 pits for the most influential politicians towards the Confederation of Canada. For this list, we're looking at people that directly made Canada closer to becoming a federation. This means it may include some people from before Canada was confederated, but that pushed Canada towards a full confederation. Number 10, Jonathan McCulley. Jonathan McCulley was not originally a supporter of Union, but his perspective was changed during the Charlottetown Conference, where he made a few contributions. His main contributions were promoting Union and Confederation to the Nova Scotians through editorials he wrote in the Morning Chronicles and the Unionist and Halifax Journal. Although he offered little during the conferences, his contributions to the Nova Scotians aided Nova Scotia joining the Confederation and not just the Canada's. This is why I would rank him at number 10. Number 9, Thomas Darcy McGee. Thomas Darcy McGee was an early visionary of Confederation within Canada from even before the conferences. He organized the Canadian visit in 1864 before the conferences, where he gave many speeches about union with the Maritimes provinces. He was also a strong supporter of the railroad, which would be a great benefit for the economy and attend in the first two conferences. I would rank him at number nine because he did support con Confederation before it was a main subject and before the conferences, but, but he still did not offer much up at the conferences. Number eight, Sir Alexander Tilush Galt. Sir Alexander Tilush Galt was at all three conferences, where he spoke about giving the right to education to the Protestant minority in Quebec. He later dropped out of the movement when his ideas were hated by most. Canada West politicians opposed giving the same rights to the Catholic minority in Canada West. However, even after leaving, his contribution was too great, and when the Constitution was drafted, the right to education for all religious minorities was in place for all provinces. I would rank him at number eight because I think this is a major part of a, of a proper confederation is the right to education for all, not just the majority. Number seven, Lord Durham. Lord Durham was appointed by Britain to reform the government. His recommendations were the first step towards a full and proper change in Canada, even though he wasn't on the scene during confederation. His recommendations were not without fault, however, especially about Canada East or Lower Canada. Without him, Britain may not have approved of a full confederation. He convinced Britain that change was necessary, and that made the first step towards what had to happen. I'd rank him at number seven, because while he didn't totally come up with the idea of confederation or the idea of union by himself, he put it into action with the government. Number six, Georges-Étienne Cartier. Georges-Étienne Cartier's goals were to ensure that Canada became a federation of provinces rather than a single legislative union in the style of Britain. He also denounced Rouge leader A.A. A. Dorian's idea that French Canada, Canada East, would be better off joining the United States by showing that French interests could be preserved under the Confederation. This led to the present-day province of Quebec, and without him, Quebec may not exist today. He also chose the goal of building a strong army, which would resist any U.S. invasions, but was also key in securing the Northwest into Confederation. I would rank him at number six, because without him, we may not have the Quebec province, that could be part of the U.S., as well as the fact that we may not have any of the Northwestern areas, including a huge chunk of B.C., Number four and five, Louis-Joseph Papineau and William Lyon Mackenzie. Although Papineau and Mackenzie were not directly involved during the Confederation of Canada, they kick-started the whole ordeal. They led the rebellions, which inspired the people, although not the full population, into wanting a better form of government. These rebellions were unsuccessful, but it showed Britain and forced them to agree that change was necessary, or the population would have to go to drastic measures again. I would rate them at number four and five, because without them, we would 
there might not be a confederation. They are what inspired the people into starting this. Number three, Charles Tupper. Tupper started the realization of confederation by proposing the Charlottetown Conference to discuss Union of the Maritimes. There he headed the delegations and helped pass the 72 resolutions. He, he started the first step of confederation by proposing a Union of the Maritimes. He ticked off the major thoughts of confederation, and without him, confederation may not have gotten that push it needed to turn from a concept into reality, as he gave MacDonald and Brown the opportunity of sharing their ideas with the general public, with the rest of the premiers, and with the Britain. Number 2. George Brown George Brown and his party, the Clear Grits, pushed forwards a major democratic feature, representation by population, or rep by pop. He also advocated the annexation of the Northwest, an idea that would bring the rest of Canada into fruition. Being the founder of the Globe, the major newspaper at the time, he also had the job of making sure that people were educated about Confederation and shared his point of view. This is a major point, but as he controlled the knowledge of all the people about Confederation, and it was his job to persuade them to follow him. He was also a member of the Great Coalition, and, put, and even though he didn't agree with all of MacDonald's points, he put aside his differences to forwards Confederation. I'm ranking him at number two, because rep by pop is super important. Before this, the government could almost pass no laws at all, because because both East and West Canada would have to both have a majority vote, when most laws wouldn't even apply properly to both colonies. Number 1. John A. MacDonald John A. MacDonald was originally against Confederation, but he later changed his mind and became a main advocate for it. He attended all three meetings and even pitched Confederation at the first one. He was a main speaker, along with his fellow members of the Great Coalition. He defended Confederation with two extremely strong arguments, that all the advantages of all the colonies being joined by a strong central government would be better than them being separate, and that the desirability of keeping British institutions and the parliamentary system. His abilities of persuasion and compromise helped extremely. He also drafted 50 of the 72 resolutions that would establish the framework for this new, united Canada. I'm rating him number one, because without him, Confederation may not have even happened at all. Or it could have taken another hundreds of years for another man like him to show up. Did you agree with our list? Which father of Confederation did we miss? For more educational, confederational top tens, make sure to subscribe to confederation.com.